So today it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the subject uh, which is caring for the mind, body, and spirit. We can certainly all use some of that no matter where we are on our journey right now. Um, approaches to coping with cancer care. So we have two speakers. The first is Dr. Jamie Cohen. Um, she is a friend and attending clinical uh, psychologist with the UCSF Psycho-Oncology Program, which is part of the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. She is also the humble head of the UCSF Survivorship Wellness Group Program, which is a fantastic resource for patients once uh, a patient is in survivorship or a caregiver um, after active treatment. Uh, she's um, happy to talk about uh, those programs that she's involved with and her clinical interests include assisting patients and their families to cope with the challenges associated with the cancer diagnosis, care, and survivorship. As a member of the psycho-oncology team, some of the services she offers include goal setting and problem navigation in the context of cancer treatment, as well as cognitive, behavioral, and mindfulness-based interventions, particularly for managing pain, insomnia, fatigue, stress, and much more. And I will add that we are really happy that she made it thus far because she is 36, we 36 weeks on the dot, I believe, today. And so we're glad that she's just holding tight so that um, we can get this wonderful experience and knowledge from her and then uh, wish her well as she continues on in her journey of um, being a mother number two. Uh, and then after um, Dr. Cohen, we'll hear from Dr. Chris Ware Jamora, who is a licensed psychologist with a specialization in rehabilitation neuropsychology. She is also a registered nurse. She is a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery and Brain Tumor Center at UCSF. She is also the director of the neuropsychology service at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And if that wasn't enough, she also co-chairs the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, Cancer and Cognition Committee. She's published um, many articles and she's been practicing in San Francisco for over 15 years. Um, in her clinical practice, she works with patients and caregivers to really help understand and treat their thinking and cognitive difficulties after brain cancer treatment. So without further ado, I would love to hand it over to Dr. Cohen first, um, and then right after her, I'll, I'll spread the floor to Dr. Ware Jamora. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much, Dr. Misher, for that, that generous um, introduction. I'm humbled. Um, I wanna thank all of you for allowing me this opportunity to be here with you this evening. And I'm looking forward to um, exploring with you all um, this topic of caring for the mind, body, and spirit um, approaches to coping with cancer care. Um, hopefully a lot of what we talk about tonight will feel relevant, regardless of where you might find yourself on your cancer journey at this moment in time. Um, so I look forward to exploring with you all how we can best understand together as a community how cancer and stress interface with one another. And then, of course, ways in which we can cope with some of the psychological and existential hardships that this experience may generate. And so I'm going to start off with some of these topics, and then my wonderful colleague, Dr. Wire Jamora, will um, deepen our exploration on some of the cognitive themes a little bit later on this evening. So just to start us off with this evening, I, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, sources of distress in cancer. Um, Certainly the, the sources of distress within the context of a cancer diagnosis, um, treatment and survivorship can be incredibly wide ranging. Um, what I have here on the screen for you are just a few examples of ways in which we may experience distress, pain or suffering following a cancer diagnosis. Um, this is of course by no means a comprehensive or universal list. Um, there may be other sources of pain as you all sit here this evening of distress or suffering that may be resonating more or less with each of you in this moment in time. But I wanted to take if just a brief moment to honor uh, a few of the ways in which this distress can present itself in all different arenas of one's life. 
And this stress and distress can manifest for each person in a number of different ways. So you may find that when you are feeling sources of pain or distress on your cancer journey, that there may be certain ways in which this becomes most apparent or, or noticeable to you. Um, for some, we might notice this presenting more physically, um, sometimes in the form of worsening physical pain, um, changes in appetite, diminished energy, or disrupted sleep. Sometimes we feel us a little bit more emotionally, um, be that in shifts in, in mood, lowered mood, feelings of depression or anxiety. We can feel this distress spiritually um, and existentially. We might notice changes cognitively, and this is something that, that Dr. Wire Jamora is going to speak to a little bit more later on this evening. We might notice our distress presenting interpersonally in a way that impacts how we relate to others in our lives, even the people that we love the most, um, or in our actions um, reflected in how we behave with ourselves or, or with the rest of the world. And so when signs of distress emerge during the cancer journey, it can be really helpful, I find, to identify avenues through which we can assert a sense of agency. Um, what we know from the psychological literature is that identifying even one small thing um, that we can impact can help to kind of pull us out of a feeling of helplessness and into a space of more productive action. And so this evening, I'd like to explore with you all where we can start to identify that sense of agency when we start to notice these signs of distress emerging in important ways in our lives. Um, which brings me to, to words of wisdom from a, um, an individual far more wise than myself. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of John Kabat-Zinn, um, who once notably said, um, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And this will, of course, be our our challenge this evening and moving forward, um, figuring out how we can learn to surf the unpredictable and sometimes turbulent waves of cancer. So to start us off with some coping strategies for this evening, um, how can we maintain some balance in unsettled waters? So we know that um, living with cancer is not only physically demanding and depleting, um, having to navigate treatment and associated symptoms, um, changes in physical functioning, but it can be equally, if sometimes if not more so, psychologically demanding and depleting as well. And so one of the um, exercises or suggestions that I'd like to offer to our, our community tonight is that it can be helpful to start by first taking a little bit of a self-inventory. Where is our battery at this moment in time? What do you find is depleting you physically and psychologically? So for example, there could be certain physical symptoms in this moment in time that are feeling especially challenging. Maybe it's feelings of uncertainty or worry or loss or grief that present themselves. And then what, if anything, is balancing that and replenishment and nourishment for you in this moment? So maybe that's spending time in nature, taking a walk outside, um, speaking with a close friend or loved one or confidant in your life. And then it can be helpful to, to reflect a little bit more, a little bit deeper. Um, how much agency and control do you have around the variables that you're listing in those categories? Because some of the things that deplete us, we might have little control over, some we may have more. Same thing for the thing, those things that replenish us. It's also really important when we're trying to take this inventory of, of sources of depletion and sources of replenishment, um, energy drains versus energy gains, as we sometimes say in psychotherapy, um, to remember that you don't have to go at this alone. Um, one of the ways that we can protect our batteries from depletion, um, as well as to replenish ourselves, is to identify meaningful sources of allyship. Um, I imagine it is a little surprise to this community here this evening um, to hear that psychological research shows um, tremendously that support is very, very important. But it can also be helpful to remember that this can be needed and likewise expressed in a few different ways. Support doesn't always look the same, the same way across the board. So sometimes the support that we seek is more instrumental in nature, completing practical needs. 
Um, sometimes what we, yearn, what we yearn for for support is more emotional in nature. Um, listening, reflecting, um, provision of empathy and understanding. Sometimes the support that we need is more informational in style, some sort of advice or guidance about how we can navigate um, a source of pain or hardship. And then sometimes what our heart yearns for is a more kind of existential or spiritual form of support, um, things that allow us to feel connected to something greater than ourselves. So this is yet another space where we can start to take a bit of a self inventory. Um, what kinds of support might you be craving most right now? Um, and to also think about who in your life can provide this, um, who might be willing or equipped to, and where might there be specific needs or gaps that you might need to address? Because alignment and support we find actually ends up being a really important component to how we navigate rough waters. I did wanna take a, a few minutes this evening to speak a little bit about um, the role of restful sleep because it is so fundamental in how we care for the mind and the body during cancer. Um, but we also know from the literature that sleep can be a tremendous challenge for our community undergoing care for cancer or recovering from cancer treatments. Um, so we know from the literature that sleep difficulties is, as well as associated daytime fatigue, because they do tend to go hand in hand, are very, very common in cancer treatment and survivorship. Optimizing sleep within the context of cancer is an enormous topic in and of itself that I could hardly do full justice to today. Um, but I wanted to at least offer just a few suggestions to help get you started. Um, so when thinking about how to kind of care for your sleep to restore that battery, it's important to remain in good communication with your medical team, your treatment team about any prescribed medications that you might be taking and how those might affect not only your sleep, but your daytime energy. Um, and to make sure that um, you're in close communication about management of any cancer and treatment related side effects that you feel may be draining that battery um, or otherwise disrupting your sleep overnight. Another big category that we like to talk about with optimizing sleep is something called sleep hygiene, um, terminology which some of you may be familiar with already. You think of it as similar to other forms of hygiene like dental hygiene or hand hygiene that we practice and that it's simply a compilation of, of behaviors that have been shown to contribute to more restful and restorative sleep. Um, one of the things that I, I find can be helpful is for sort of generating and remembering strategies aligned with sleep hygiene recommendations is to, um, as I like to say, embrace your inner child. As many of these um, recommendations like establishment of a, a bedtime routine and ritual, having consistent bedtimes and wake times and sort of optimizing your sleep environment, not just for physical comfort, but for psychological and emotional comfort as well, tend to overlap um, very elegantly with a lot of the strategies that um, adults would sort of intuitively think to implement if they were helping a small child go to sleep. And so if you can embrace sort of your inner five-year-old um, and think about the things that you might intuitively think to do for a small child around sleep, we find that the, the science supports that adults benefit from those as well. We wanna make sure, especially with, with cancer treatment, sleep disruptions, that you're reserving your bed in your bedroom for sleep as much as you can, as opposed to other more activating activities. Um, and so long as it's within parameters deemed safe by your treatment team, trying to embrace the movement, gentle movement during the day, also a really good technique for helping to mitigate that cancer-related fatigue. You can also think a little bit about being strategic with your worry time. And what I mean by that um, would be kind of carving out some time during the day to help kind of process through, digest any um, big thoughts and feelings that you feel might be um, interfering with your sleep at night. And this could be a good time to kind of think about that allyship and other forms of support. And that's something we can talk about a little bit more later this evening. And you can also experiment a little bit with different relaxation techniques. Um, anything from deep diaphragmatic breathing to guided visualization, guided imagery, um, to targeted muscle relaxation, help get the mind and the body in a space that's more accepting of sleep. Um, so I know that's quite a lot in one slide, but I wanted to at least offer a few tidbits to help folks get started. But what I'd like to spend the, the rest of our 
brief time together uh, speaking about this evening, um, another way in which we can care for the, the body, mind, and spirit um, during cancer is through cultivation of a practice of mindfulness and making intentional choices that are deeply rooted in what we value most in our lives. Um, so I'm going to take a few moments to, to discuss each of these approaches in turn. For those of you for whom this might be a, a relatively new concept, um, mindfulness is essentially the practice of acceptance of a present moment reality. It means to pay attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and without judgment. And in the context of cancer care, we find that this can really help with everything from symptom management around things like pain and insomnia, to enhancing quality of life by alleviating elements of stress, anxiety, and depression, or shifting the relationship that we might have with those. So for some of you, this may be a, an already long established practice, um, for others entirely novel. Um, but these are some questions that you may wanna ask yourself if you were getting started. How often do I find myself mindful still and present as opposed to distracted or automatic in my everyday actions. Um, mindfulness is very much a, a muscle that requires continuous exercise like any other muscle in our body. So without continual practice, we find that it atrophies and we need to sort of uh, re-energize a practice. What do we think could happen? What would we experience if we were to pause for just a moment? And what would happen if we were to allow ourselves to be the witness to or the observer of our experiences, watching a moment without trying to alter it or change it in any way? So how do we actually practice this? Um, while it, it intellectually may seem academically um, to be a simple premise, um, it's perhaps not surprisingly rather difficult, I think, for many of us to practice in real time. Um, so a few steps to, to keep in mind if this is something that you're looking to cultivate. We would want to seek to reserve judgment, so observing without evaluation of a moment. Um, and when we find ourselves judging, which we, I think as human beings, all have a, um, a rather primal tendency to do, to do our best not to judge our judging, as silly as that may sound. Um, we can practice acceptance of each moment. Um, a beautiful quote that I think captures this sentiment, um, a blanket spread out on the lawn accepts both the rain and the sun, each leaf that falls upon it. And to do one thing at a time with all of our attention. And we'll talk about a few different ways that we can implement this in sort of a daily practice. So let's talk a, for a few minutes about um, a few practical ways that we can have a, a workable practice of mindfulness that you could start at any time if you haven't already experimented with this. So there are a few different ways that we can integrate mindfulness into our daily lives during or after a cancer treat, uh, diagnosis. One method is through practicing mindfulness of what we do. So for example, we could practice something called mindful breathing. What that would entail would be to notice what it feels like to breathe. Each inhale, each exhale. It's something that we do countless times each day, but more often than not without noticing it. So we can notice where we feel our breath in our body. You could also try a mindful activity like a mindful walk. So this could be, um, choosing to focus our attention, let's say, on the bottoms of our feet as we take each step while we walk. Maybe walking slower than you typically do, focusing your attention on that feeling as your feet make contact with the ground. Noticing what you see and hear and smell, just breathing in the sensory experience of that walk. What muscles you might notice, and if they're trying to tell you anything. So you could do this with a walk or any other form of physical activity if you wanted to experiment with it. One of my favorites, um, having a mindful bite or a mindful meal. So focusing our attention on what it's like to be tasting something by either observing or describing your experience in that moment, describing its shape, its texture, its flavor, 
and your own responses, what sorts of feelings and thoughts that experience generates. You could also try mindful body scans. This would be sort of noticing different parts of your body from head to toe, what you feel and where you feel it. Trying again, not to, to judge, but simply to notice and observe. Or to have a little bit of fun with this, maybe trying a daily chore or task that you would be doing anyway, but doing it in a mindful style. So thinking of something that you might do mindlessly each day, um, for example, washing dishes or brushing your teeth. Um, so to take an opportunity the next time you find yourself in this activity, thinking about what it feels like to have your hands move in and out of the water, um, what temperatures or textures or sensations that brings up. So they're all just small ways of inserting a little bit of mindfulness in our day to day. We can also be mindful observers of our thoughts and certainly going through cancer and cancer treatment, we may have some very big thoughts that emerge. One way that we can do this is to imagine our thoughts floating by, almost as if they were clouds on a breeze, cars on a road, or leaves floating down a stream. And what we would seek to do in this kind of exercise is to reserve judgment of those thoughts and simply be the witness to them. And it's, it's always difficult to be mindful, I think, of the temptation to interfere with change or even rid yourself of certain thoughts, but the, the intention behind this exercise would be to simply let the thoughts flow and to let them do what they do. And with those thoughts, we may find emotions coming up. So we can also practice mindfulness of emotions. The first step would be to notice the feeling. And then we can take it one step further with our mindfulness and see if we can name or describe the emotion. So what word or Maybe it's not a word, maybe it's a color or a shape or a texture. Best describes what you're feeling. Maybe it's angry, maybe it's restless, scared, anxious. And to ask ourselves how we know we're feeling that way. Where, where can we feel it in our body? The next and perhaps most difficult step is to intentionally accept the emotion, whatever it may be as a normal human experience. It can be helpful to embrace a sense of curiosity about how it came about, what it was, the set of circumstances that may have contributed to you feeling that way. But we wanna be sure not to condone or judge the emotion. We simply wanna let it move through us without resistance, without struggling against it or encouraging it. Again, the, the common theme here with mindfulness is being the observer or the watcher. I turned to some wise words from John Kabat-Zinn earlier. I will turn to some more wise words from Cookie Monster now. Um, simply to reflect the idea that um, it, it's tempting to think first of mindfulness, I think of pleasant experiences, joy, satisfaction, vitality, exuberance. But with mindfulness, I think our biggest challenge is to practice mindfulness and observation of thoughts emotions and behaviors without judgment, even those thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that we might deem to be unpleasant. And certainly in the context of cancer, um, those are numerous. For example, can we challenge ourselves to practice mindfulness of grief, of fear, of loss or sadness? What about mindfulness of physical pain or discomfort? And so that, that brings me to a, another space that I, I wanted to explore, which is um, seeking balance of mindfulness of two, um, two big arenas that can sometimes uh, coexist in cancer uh, and cancer survivorship, which is gratitude and grief and their, their respective roles in the cancer journey. What we know from the, the scientific literature is that mindfulness of those things for which we can feel authentically uh, thankful, gratitude, um, can be truly healing medicine. Well, it can be incredibly challenging um, to feel grateful during and after cancer treatment. Um, gratitude does afford us, I think, some opportunity to honor potential benefits or areas of personal growth. Um, 
For example, feeling a renewed sense of closeness with loved ones or, or perhaps a clarity about what might be most important to us. But if this doesn't feel honest or, or authentic in every single moment, as it rarely does, um, then gratitude sort of ceases to be healing and it can start to become a bit of an oppressive expectation, especially for our cancer community. In truth, there are many, many emotions that accompany this experience. Everything from at times genuine relief and gratitude, perhaps when we receive re reassuring results from our providers, um, but then also moments of profound uncertainty, sadness, fear, or grief. All of that is okay to hold with dignity and respect. Um, our task then becomes how to properly honor the grief that we may have um, for what may have been lost or may be ending as a result of a cancer experience, while also creating opportunity with intention for welcoming of new beginnings and possibilities. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that when, when truly balanced, there can be exquisite beauty in that process. So from this space as a mindful observer, we might find ourselves better able to cultivate a stance of what we refer to in, in uh, some psychological frameworks as psychological flexibility. Um, this is a principle that comes from a scientifically supported framework called acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, the main goals of acceptance and commitment therapy are to help us to accept what might be out of our personal control, clarify what is important and, important and meaningful to us, which is within our control, and commit to taking action that enriches our lives, also within our control. Which brings us to the topic of identifying personal values and the importance of remaining tethered to these and making mindful choices about how we wish to honor our values while navigating cancer and with all of the challenges that that entails. So values are activities that we care about and that give our lives meaning. They can be dynamic and shaped over time by our experiences. Um, cancer diagnosis and treatment certainly being a landmark experience for most. And when we connect with our values, we find that we're able to move our lives in meaningful directions, even in the face of difficult or painful experiences like cancer. So values are a little bit different than what we would traditionally think of as goals. Um, we wanna be thinking of values more like a direction, um, more so than a destination, um, in the sense that goals can be achieved or accomplished, but values less so. Um, if I were to, let's say, embrace the value of compassion or self-compassion, I'm not going to wake up one morning and sort of say, check, compassion, done. Um, but these are sort of directions that I could make intentions to strive and lean into through my daily choices and goals. So what I have for you here are just a few examples of domains in which what we would call our core um, values might manifest. So for example, we can ask ourselves clarifying questions like, what kinds of relationships do I wanna have with my family, friends, and loved ones? What kind of relationship do I wanna cultivate with myself? perhaps one of tenderness and self-compassion or patience? What kind of work do you value? How would you like to learn and grow as a person? What would you like to know more about? Or how would you like to tend to your body? And so in our um, final moments before I, I turn the, the virtual floor over to my colleague, Dr. Wara Jamora, I wanted to offer us just a small moment of, of silent reflection um, to invite you to consider the following as you think about where you may be now in your cancer journey and how you might want to manifest the values that you find most important in your day-to-day -day life. And if there's anything that you feel might get in your way, what are the barriers? How can you best support yourself with compassion, seek allyship in the ways we spoke about a little bit earlier, Focus on where we can assert a sense of agency and control and, expect, and practice acceptance where we cannot. And ways that we can move into these values of yours today, this week, this month, or whatever time frame feels most resonant to you right now. Um, 
but that you feel would reflect your values in a meaningful and enriching way in your life. There are a few additional resources for support offered through my department at UCSF, um, Psycho-Oncology. Um, I put a few of those resources up here, happy to speak to them a little bit more at the end of the evening, um, but wanted to thank you for just that, that brief amount of time that I was able to spend with you um, before turning the virtual floor back over to Dr. Mishra to introduce Dr. Wire G. Moore. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much. There is such a wealth of information in what you just presented. Um, what's coming up for me is I am literally coming off of, as I was telling you earlier, a five-day retreat all about mindfulness. And so you have beautifully distilled years and years of what all of us will be in some form of that journey um, into a sort of bite-sized amount for us to take in today, uh, which we really appreciate. Um, uh, I'm, there will be time to dive into some of those topics later, but thank you so much, Dr. Cohen, for, for giving that um, initial take in. And then I would love to pass it over to Dr. Chris Weir Jamora for our second talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jamie. It was really, I just love every time I love hearing you talk and I, I feel like I pick something new from, from your wise words. So thank you for, um, it's just a hard act to follow. So as Dr. Mishra had mentioned, my name is Chris Wire Jamora. I'm a um, rehabilitation neuropsychologist. I work in the Brain Tumor Center at UCSF and a couple of other places. And I'm really excited to talk about um, the thinking changes and more importantly, what to do about um, what what are some ideas to do about um, some of those thinking changes that are common in the cancer journey. So we'll talk a little bit, my my time, I, I've planned to talk a little bit about just some of the commonality and also some of the type of thinking changes that come up in the context of um, cancer and cancer treatments, um, ways to reduce, even if you don't have cancer, ways to reduce risk to um, thinking changes, um, but of course, cancer care can, can, um, can compound those changes. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, also some strategies, um, some help, some, some strategies that you can do to, to begin thinking about um, just ways to live well, despite some of these changes. And then also sometimes people ask me about technology and apps. And, and so um, the, the folks that I work with, the patients that I work with have just been so generous to um, share those with me in, in, the, in the time that I work with them. So they always encourage me to share the ones they find to be really successful. I don't have any financial relationships with any of these. So, but I thought I would share those um, as, as kind of wisdom that I've I've gained from the folks that I've worked with and, and hope that you find them useful too. All of us from time to time have the experience of forgetting a word, we're trying to say, um, going into the other room and not remembering why we went in there. And, 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 and even sometimes, you know, one of my patients said, you know, I, before I had cancer, I couldn't remember where I parked my car, but really now this is really tough. Um, and these are some common lap lapses that are just part of the human condition when we're feeling stressed and, you know, and or part of sometimes our, our journey in life. And that especially whenever, but more so that whenever there are changes to the brain itself. Um, and so you'll hear me use this word cognition, um, thinking difficulties or cognition. It's really defined as something that, um, that whenever you're doing or thinking through a thought or experience in your sentence, sense, senses, and, and then includes thinking, knowing, remembering, uh, problem solving, processing information. And there's also higher levels of uh, brain functions that encompass language and imagination and perception and planning. And, and cancer-related thinking changes are common across different types of cancer and are shown um, in this figure. And as you can see, this, um, this figure notes that cancer experience of cognitive changes are particularly common in, um, in cancer in the brain, but also can be uh, common in other types of cancer as well. So for many people with living with cancer, cognitive changes are often a part of managing um, their disease and change depending on many factors. So, and they're not linear. So for example, one study found that almost that more than 70 to 80% of individuals that had small cell lung cancer had memory changes even before they had treatment um, and or had those changes at diagnosis. 
Um, so for many individuals who have uh, who have recovery in the months or, or, or so after surgery and or radiation, um, particularly in areas of attention and concentration, they can notice that they're just feeling a lot more distracted. They're thinking they just don't kind of feel as though they're they're sharp as they as they were before. Um, and while some uh, and while others may not have a similar recovery, other factors can also contribute. So um, so some of the folks that I work with, um, what they talk about is um, whenever they're in conversation, they, they have a hard time with um, tracking all of the multiple conversations that are happening at one time. Um, they, they might have a hard time with um, remembering, uh, remembering things unless they write them down. Or if they have to do more than one thing at a time, then um, they, they notice that they really can, can, it can be really frustrating or irritating or, or difficult to, to do that as before. To, before. Um, and that day-to-day -day activities that were once kind of automatic that they could do, and they could do you know, pretty much without thinking, not take much more time and much more effort to do. Um, and these changes may not be readily apparent to other people. So sometimes some of the folks that I work with will say, you know, my, my, my wife said that I seem like I'm fine, but I don't feel like I'm fine. I'm different. And, and I feel like that they don't get it, uh, this invisibility, so to speak, where they, there can be a difference between sometimes how other people perceive you and, and you, you, you yourself, you could be struggling to find words or um, maybe ask a lot of uh, clarifying questions because you're, you're just not quite um, understanding what the other person is saying or remembering real time. Um, and so while all these, these changes may be invisible to others, they can still be a really a very real problem. So does cancer and cancer treatments cause thinking problems? Well, I think the answer from my understanding of the literature is, is yes. So depending on the treatment, so more than, you know, it, more than 35% of people can have persistent issues post-treatment, even if you don't have cancer in the brain. Um, my work primarily works with people with cancer in the brain where throughout their course, people can have 80 to, you know, 70 to 80 percent of people can have changes, um, you know, cognitive changes in the context of their illness. So um, there's, there's, there's also individuals that experience something called chemo brain, where they, they just feel foggy and off and, and you know, um, feel distracted and, and forgetful. Um, and typically what at least the literature says is, is that for many people that does improve um, after the, the completion of chemotherapy, but for some people it doesn't and that it can be a, it can be a long-term challenge that, that they end up having to manage. And we also know other therapies such as radiotherapy or radiation, especially whole brain radiation has been ne definitely negatively, um, ha has been associated with cognitive changes, especially things like um, being more easily distracted, slow thinking speed, having trouble kind of remembering things um, above and beyond just the, the location of where that, that radiotherapy was. And then there's other things as well. So. Um, steroids. Sometimes people can have changes to their cognition as it relates to steroids, as well as some anti-seizure medications that can also um, have an impact. Some medications have more of a cognitive burden than others. And so there there's, can be lots of reasons why you can have changes to your thinking. Um, and these, these treatments are important. They can be life-saving. And also it can um, mean that having symptoms and then is important to have some management of those symptoms because the thinking changes can get in the way of your day, day. It's important to remember that not everyone with cancer will have cognitive thinking changes, but the areas that are most commonly affected by cancer and cancer treatments include being attention and concentration, memory, executive functions, and processing speed. So what does that mean? So for example, you can think of the executive system as the conductor of the brain. So it makes sure that we're trying to um, you know, make sure we have certain functions that, uh, that work in concert with one another. It helps with planning, organiz organizing, problem solving, motivation, being able to pay attention for long periods of time. And so, um, so making sure that we're 
doing all that we can to both understand the nature of the, the challenges that we're experiencing. Um, and that sometimes with some, some types of cancer, the brain um, can reorganize itself. So there is, so the brain, as we know, is plastic. It's not a, a static organ. So we can, um, we can, those, those cognitive processes can be redistributed to other areas. And so we, we can have, we can have change effects within the brain, both as it relates to treatment, but also as it relates to health. So we can get better and better at certain aspects of cognition. And there are some aspects of thinking that are a little bit more um, responsive to treatment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But so I, I encourage people to not think of the brain as fixed, but also just a very dynamic um, organ that can change over time, both for the better as well as for the worse. And that, um, and that the areas sometimes tell the story, but also the, the interaction of the different areas, such as the, the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes, the parietal lobes also can be important as well. So what are some things that you can do to help reduce cognitive risks and thrive with having, with or without having cognitive changes? So some of the things that we think about are avoiding toxins. So that, so for example, air pollution has been really negatively, it has really been associated with changes in cognition. So we would want to, um, and then also inhalation of, of toxins. So that would be something that of course we would want to um, you know, avoid. But then you also think about things like um, healthy coping. So depression and anxiety. So taking care of, um, of yourself and, and finding ways to cope with challenges and, and stresses and coping is, is really important as, as Jamie had said. And it's not just good for your emotional health, it's also good for your brain. Limiting alcohol. So alcohol has been associated with negative impacts in uh, cognition. And so wanting to make sure that you're within healthy, safe drinking limits when, when you're thinking about alcohol and if you're having a hard time with managing your relationship with alcohol, then that's, a, that's something important to talk with your doctor about in, in terms of some ways to, to reduce that risk to your brain. Food, exercise, and sleep. And that's a big category. So that's a big lifestyle category. So sleep, of course, we, there's, a, there's a lot of studies that if you, if you aren't getting good, consistent sleep, that that can really negatively impact your learning. It can negatively impact also your ability to sustain your attention and concentration. It impacts your mood. So getting good sleep is really important to, to um, reversing some of those effects. Of, um, of, the, of the impact of in, on your cognition. Also exercise, if there's, you know, there's been so many studies because about um, the, in, the benefit of exercise for cognition, because every time you're moving your body, you're moving your brain. And so it's really important to, um, to integrate good exercise into, um, you know, into your day-to-day -day routine as that does improve, it does improve your cognition. Also making sure there, there are antioxidants and, and other types of foods. None, not one of these things is, um, it, you know, not one type of food. You know, there, there's, uh, I see these new studies about um, blueberries and, and different ones, but you know, what, what I really, uh, what I see the most is, is that if you have a healthy lifestyle that reduces other medical comorbid diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, that have a very, um, that can have a really negative impact on your, on your brain in, in terms of your vasculature and, and, and your cardiovascular status, which of course, you know, the brain is a very vascular organ. So you're, you'll uh, definitely, if you're keeping your cardiovascular health in mind, that will also support your brain health. Avoiding falls and head injuries. So that of course is, is something that we, uh, that we see um, that, you know, whenever you have, um, whenever you hit your head or you have a traumatic brain injury, um, that it increases your risk to have another, and that of course can negatively impact your thinking. Socialization and novelty also is really important because it, again, it helps to engage the brain in a new and different way. So some of my, some of the folks that I work with, they, they really, um, they, they want to, they, they want to learn a new language or they want to, um, they want to learn something new and stay active and, and stay engaged in, in things that are, um, you know, that are, um, you know, really helpful to them to, to keep them fresh and 
and, and keep their brain working. Um, and then of course, getting cognitive help. That is very important that if you've tried a lot of things and you're still struggling with um, some challenges and uh, forgetfulness or getting distracted or slow thinking, then making sure that you're, you're considering having some, you know, talking to your doctor about that to have some uh, cognitive consultation to make sure that uh, you're, you're getting the right person to think about if these changes are um, you know, age-related changes or if it's something else that, that maybe needs treatment. Some of the folks that I work with say, yeah, 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 but what if, what if I've already done that? I'm already doing all that and I'm still struggling. And, and so thinking about some initial guided principles when you're thinking about ways to manage your thinking difficulties. So first, starting with managing fatigue, overwhelm, and sleep. So a lot of the folks that I work with, they oftentimes, um, they, their, their cognitive gas tank is smaller. So they can do the things they need to do, but they, they run out of energy faster and they start off with less cognitive energy. So their battery is, you know, as Dr. Cohen had that really beautiful graphic about a battery, you can also think about that from a cognitive perspective and, you know, being able to manage some of that cognitive fatigue. And we'll talk about some ways to do that and overwhelm can go a long way towards reducing those, they call them symptom flares, the cognitive symptom flares, where you'll have a, a flare of, you know, just, I can't remember anything. Like, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I can't remember anything. Um, and, and being able to first do a check with yourself, like, okay, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Maybe I'm, I'm gonna take some deep breaths and we do some of the mindfulness. And then also, you know, I didn't sleep very well last night. So I probably need to do, you know, I probably need to go to bed a little bit early and, and sleep um, and, and try to see if that will help. And then also maybe I need to deprioritize some things for my schedule today because I'm just not, I'm really not feeling up to it. And, and so I know if I try to push myself harder and harder and harder, I'm going to continue to, you know, have more symptom flares. So making some of those decisions about that. And so, and also developing and implementing some systems to help you get things done. So one of the, um, one of the folks that I work with will say, you keep saying, I need to have a system. You know what? I think, you know, that these, you know, me getting out of the house, I can't seem to get out of the house without going back in four times to remember my keys, my phone, you know, my, my wallet. So I'm going to have a system to get out of the house in a way that's a little bit more efficient because that seems to be a time whenever I'm having a hard time. So having us, you know, being able to figure out, like, these are my biggest time wasters in terms of the things I seem to be forgetting. Let me do some problem solving about a way to have like a predictable routine to be able to help fill the gap for my forgetfulness. Being the mindfulness that, or, you know, having a mindful uh, approach, you know, that that's also really supported in the rehabilitation literature because the more present you are in tasks, the more you're trying to control your attention and concentration onto what you're doing and you're trying to ignore other things, the more successful you're likely to be to finish that thing. So for example, if I'm going to the store and I'm keeping it in my mind, I've got to get the I got to get the ground beef. I got to get the brown ground beef. We're going to have tacos. And if I, you know, I could write a list, which I, I definitely should do instead. But if I am really focused and clear about, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to reduce distractors if I can. And I'm going to be focused on, on doing that thing. The likelihood of you being able to do that is much more successful. Now, the devil's in the details, right? So, um, so sometimes we feel like life throws us a lot of curveballs and it can be really hard to focus on one thing at a time but all the more important that we try. And, and considering feedback from others, sometimes others have really good ideas about ways that we can help ourselves. And so starting there can be, can be ways to, to, um, to find our way through this next step. And we also, we strive for progress rather than perfection in the context of this. So some other ways that you can sharpen your thinking is pacing yourself reducing overstimulation and organizational strategies and apps. And that's what we're going to talk about in this last portion of, um, of our time. And, and maybe they'll give you some ideas, probably some of which you're already doing. And maybe, you know, maybe there'll be something new in there to, that'll also be helpful too. So pacing is really critical for building better thinking stamina. So sometimes we get into the cycle of we, 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 get a, we try to get a lot done, we, we then we're exhausted 
and then we have a big symptom flare, such as forgetfulness or whatever it is, um, or slowed thinking. And then we're, we're down for, you know, we're, we're down for the count for a long time and it takes us a long time to recover from that. And so we have these big swings. So the goal is really for us to pace ourselves to have better stamina, but also to have less thinking symptoms, that's cognitive thinking flares. So if we try to pull back when we're starting to feel like we're in the yellow, for example, when we're starting to kind of feel like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to forget more things. Okay, I need to slow down, I need to pull back and do a little bit less or take a break, then or we'll do a different type of cognitive activity. So if you're working on a, a Zoom presentation and you're starting to stumble over your words, which you probably have heard me stumble over my words a few times, something that you can begin to think about is, okay, I need to slow down my rate of speech. I need to pause ever so often because I'm starting to have a harder time, the harder I push myself. And then the words come a little bit more easily. And then after, I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna take a break. I'm not gonna do more work after I, I, you know, after I after I do a presentation, for example. I'll I'll go ahead and, and take a break for a little while, maybe not talk because those word finding problems will crop up again if I try to do more whenever I haven't quite fully recovered. So you can think about it like, kind of like a U-shaped curve. Sometimes when you're in the green, you can feel like, okay, I'm feeling good. And then, but then you do some tasks and you then feel like, okay, I'm in the yellow. I'm starting to feel a little tired. Sometimes our inclination is I need to do more because I'm starting to run out of energy. But really, it's you think about it like a bank account. You can you can't you can only take out so much energy out of your bank before you're overdrawn and you're in the red. And once you're in the red, it, you can see it takes a long time to get back to the green. And so the goal is is to figure out how to get back to green as quick as possible. So and being able to notice early on and and prevent getting into the red. So you can think about it like a stoplight. So whenever you're in green. It's okay, go and do what you need to do. But when you're in yellow, that's when you have to yield. You have to begin to slow down, begin to think, oh, you know, I don't know if I have to, as much energy to, to do all the rest of this. I think I need to be prioritized. I think maybe I'll send a couple of emails and you know, maybe, maybe I'll have to re reschedule some things. Maybe I, I need to take a walk. Maybe I need to shut my eyes and you know, get some visual rest. Sometimes it means I need to kind of have less stimulation um, and to process less information, um, all of those things. And being kind of like your own scientist in a way where you're like, okay, if I do these things, it helps me to come back to green quickly, more quickly. Okay, those need to be kind of part of my toolkit and part of my regular practice. And the more you practice just saying, okay, am I red, yellow, green? Okay, well, I'm in the red. Okay, so I need to, I need to do these things. Kind of that committed action that Dr. Cohen talked about. Um, that, that will go a long way towards feeling better. So overstimulation is one of the major things that I see in individuals that have brain and thinking changes that lead to more symptoms, more cognitive symptoms. So it's very important to consider rest and pacing um, that a lot of light and a lot of noise. A lot of the folks that I work with, they used to love, you know, they'll talk about, I used to love going to a concert, but now I can't do concerts. They're too much. They're just too, too much. Um, because all that, all that commotion, your brain has to process all that information. And so all that, all that information kind of lands upon you. It's like drinking from a fire hose is one of my, was one of my patients talked about. Um, so in, so needing to do some different things to put those filters into place because those filters are a little too porous now. So increasing daily structure that can buffer some of the stimulation, redirecting your other people to others, you know, you know, trying to redistribute non-essential duties to other people or trying not to try not to always be in the mix of things if you can. Giving yourself extra time that it might take twice as long to do the same task and beginning to having some acknowledgement that, that maybe it, it does take longer to do things. You, know, you can limit people, places, and things. One of the folks that I work with, they said, you know, I can only do one or two friends at a time. I can't do a big dinner party anymore. And being able to, you know, have those heartfelt conversations that maybe that's what you need right now. 
um, and then addressing triggers if you're starting to notice there's certain stimulation triggers for you. Getting things done is, is a huge part of, I think, why people come see me and that we work a lot on and having a system and working your system um, and deciding what works best for you may be really different than what works best for the next person. Um, most people have some kind of daily routine. They, they get up, they kind of have their routine and being able to use that as, as a way to kind of learn about what works best for you. So having, having the perfect routine or having the perfect system, sometimes that's less important than just doing it consistently. Um, and then if you're feeling overwhelmed, having breaking it down into smaller pieces can be a really helpful place to start anywhere, to start somewhere to be able to help you feel better. Try not to keep a lot of information in your head. Um, you know, a lot of folks, they feel like that they, they don't really do lists and, you know, and, and they are always running their list in their head, which can be really cognitively taxing. So try to, you know, try to begin emptying out your list in, in, in different ways so, so that we aren't having to always process information and you can give your brain a rest. And, and pre-planning and, and preparing in advance can be really important and, and dealing with that time pressure um, because that time pressure you might notice if you have thinking changes that you also have maybe more sensitivity to stress. And so reducing, uh, anticipate and reduce stress if, if you possibly can. So these are some apps that some of the folks that I work with, they love. And so I always want to, um, they always encourage me to mention them because, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not one to reinvent the wheel. And so calendaring with reminders, um, sometimes people use Google Calendar, sometimes people, uh, they really like their paper calendar, which is totally fine too, um, but picking one calendar. So trying not to have multiple calendars and trying to be as consistent as possible that you're saying, well, let me write this down or let me get this on my calendar before we end. And then you say it back to the person, say, okay, now I'm going to see you, Dr. Wire, tomorrow on Thursday, at, uh, Thursday the 5th at 2, a, 2 p.m. Is that right? And I'll say, yes, it's Thursday, 2 p.m. And then you verify it. But having that call and uh, that, that teach back where you're saying it and then you're confirming it and not moving on until you've done it in the moment is far more effective than, than not doing that. For some of the individuals that I work with, they have a really hard time with reading or even texting. So Otter is a tech is a voice to text app that's been that uh, some of the folks that I work with they really like because it reduces that load because they have a hard time with being able to be texting. And there's another um, one that I think a lot of the folks that I work with they really like is called a Fabulous, and it really helps to get them working on a daily routine. So they, they, one of the folks that I work with, they said is, is that it, it really helped them to establish their daily routine and it gave reminders to pace them through their daily routine, which they found really helpful. Um, so, so what's in your system is really to think about. Set a time, uh, having consistency and doing things on particular days, for example. So for me, laundry is always on Saturday. Um, and if I don't get a chance to do, and if I didn't finish the laundry, by, you know, by Saturday, it's probably not going to get done again until the next Saturday. So I have to plan accordingly for that. Um, the same thing with, for example, uh, plan meal planning. Sometimes people really find that that's helpful for them because making those decisions real time is, is hard. That They have a hard time with um, in terms of getting home, feeling exhausted, and then figuring out what they have to eat. Um, so trying to, to kind of pre pre look at some of those um, pre look at some of those challenges and build systems to be able to reduce that in your daily life. So these are some other um, other things that some of the folks that I work with they they use is they'll um, is that they'll use Trello for project planning for example. So if you have a big project and you're having a hard time with being able to um, with be able to track all the pieces. Trello is something that sometimes people use to be able to um, track through times what has been done, what needs to be done, and what and at what date. And then um, additionally, there's um, there's a there's some literature about um, to do lists where if you sort your to do list by urgency of needing it to be done, you're much more likely to be more um, uh, you're much more light and breaking it down into kind of increments of. These are the things I need to get done in the next few days. These are the things I need to get done in the next week. And these are the things that would be nice to get done, but you know they're not really on my top of mind. 
it, they, they noticed that if people will work on their list in that way, um, a little bit every day, they're, they get much more done at the, at the end rather than trying to have these big um, long lists that can feel overwhelming to look at versus chunk, chunking it out. And one of my uh, one of my folks that I work with, they they took that one step further and they used Google Keep to be able to do that, where he had different squares and then he would just check those things off, and and that was really helpful for him because he wasn't a paper wasn't a paper to do this sort of person. So what are some else thing in the last few minutes that we have? What are else? So what else are, can I do to get more things done? So this is a busy slide, but really there's two things. So one is something called Focus Mate or Focus Buddy. So one of the folks that I work with, they really needed someone else to help them account, stay accountable. And so what they would do is they, they signed up for this app called Focus Mate. And really what it is, it's someone else that you're, that is kind of like an office mate with you and that, but they're, but they, um, and you're agreeing, like, I'm going to do this thing, you know, this time you're committing to it. And then, and then you complete that thing. And so what this individual found is that was really helpful that he um, kind of committed to getting this thing done and that there was somebody else that he could, um, that could help, help hold him accountable for that. So the other thing are the other tasks or things just to think about. So tackle your inbox at set time. So for me, in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, that's what I do my emails. I don't do them all throughout the day. Um, get physically active before tackling a boring task. Sometimes, for example, we need to, we, we dread these boring, you know, grinding tasks. So we, we need to maybe do some physical activity before we do that. So that way we feel ready to kind of do that, do that boring task. Also setting a timer. So using something called Pomodoro, um, which we'll talk a little bit about and logging deadlines into your Google calendar, for example. So if you have something that needs to be done, having a, a deadline associated with it and having enough a reminder lead time to be able to get that finished. Um, and try to limit your availability also. So really, um, you know, if you need blocks of time to do, the, to do things, putting those on your calendar versus trying to shoehorn them in in different times. So that way you're also holding enough space for yourself for things that you need to do. So one of the things that, uh, that I find really helpful is Pomodoro, where you're doing things in chunks, for example. So you'll do something for, you'll pre-plan, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do this presentation, I'm gonna spend 25 minutes doing it, and then I'm gonna take a cognitive break. And that you, you kind of begin to kind of do things in chunks and you're pacing yourself with how much you do, and then you break. And no sneaky working when you're breaking. And that's when you kind of do the red, yellow, green, where you're saying, okay, I'm feeling wiped out. I can't do anymore. So I'm already at red. So I need to I need to take a longer break and get back to green. And those are some ways that you can begin to reduce the propensity to have more um, cognitive thinking flares because you're kind of doing things in smaller chunks versus kind of just continuously doing thing for doing something for hours and hours and hours. And then there's also apps, of course, um, that can help with the the Pomodoro and the Focus Keeper to be able to kind of keep you on, keep you on, on track in terms of doing things in chunks rather than doing them in long, in long phases. Cause sometimes that sustained attention really needs a, a reboot, um, you know, as you're, as you're doing things. So other apps, um, NBAC is one that is good for, if you're noticing that you're, um, that you're really having a hard time kind of remembering, uh, remembering things short term, that's one that um, that we see over and over again that does help. You have to do a lot of it. So you have to do like, like 30 minutes a day for two weeks, and then you can see a little bit more crispness in, in your attention and concentration. Um, using, um, using apps called Calm and Headspace can be helpful to, to reduce um, just the, that, feeling of, um, that feeling of anxiety and, and, and also trying to uh, improve your attentional control through meditation. And then also dragon speaking can be helpful if you notice that it's much more challenging for you to, to write, um, that speaking is easier. Sometimes that can be, can be used. So if you've done everything and you can't, you, and you, you think of everything, one of the things that you might consider talking with your provider about is seeing a neuropsychologist who, who may be able to help with um, understanding with you about 
what's going on in terms of your thinking and mood changes, track those changes with you. Sometimes people do need also um, some help um, if they're noticing thinking changes for disability and that can be helpful in terms of documentation for that or returning to work or to school. Um, and also understanding um, uh, different types of help needed at home. Sometimes we those thinking changes prevent us from being able to do cooking, laundry, food shopping, and sometimes it can be helpful to have another set of eyes and ears to help say yes, yes, yes. That that is something you're that's challenging. Let, let me um, help with. Uh, let, let me help your caregiver um, give you some ideas about how to manage that. So you can get a better idea of your brain strengths and challenges. You can get information from your doctor and your care team that can guide your treatment plan. And also can give you some recommendations from day-to-day -day life that can help you and your family members and, and also succeed in school or in work or live independently, um, which is, you know, I think this can be a really important thing, especially if you're, if you're having difficulties with being able to do that. Again, cognitive thinking changes are really common and they're multi-determined in cancer care. You know, starting with managing fatigue and exercise, healthy diet, and having emotional support is important. And track really what works for you. And, and cognitive rehabilitation um, and or seeing a neuropsychologist, if you've tried everything else, may be helpful, but it also might not be a fit for everybody, and that's okay. And talking with your doctor and your care team about possible resources and cognitive care providers, if you have tried everything and you'd like to learn more, can be an option. Thank you so much. I'm excited to hear more about any questions you have and, and be helpful in whatever way I can. Thank you, Dr. Weir-Jamora. So practical and um, just full of really useful um, resources, apps, uh, things to think about. Um, really great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you, Dr. Cohen, for joining back as well. And the floor is open, so as the questions come in, um, I will make sure to take note. I'm sure everyone is just grasping all the information that has been uh, delivered to them. So I thank you for both uh, for that. Um, I'm going to start with a question on sleep. But before I get to the specific question, um, because this is such um, this is such a critical part, especially not only cancer, but COVID and everything happening in the world, um, sleep is a difficult thing for people to um, get a hold of, maintain it, sustain it. Um, it seems to be, be very elusive. And so my question before the specific question that came in is, um, I would love to dive in a little bit deeper on sleep with both of you and particularly on practical. One thing that I really love about this course is kind of folks leaving here with some practical tips. Um, and I know it's not easy without knowing everyone's specific situation, but what are some common things that when patients come to you or when you are talking to people, what are some common things, either things for people to think about in terms of number of hours to sleep, timing of when they sleep, eating, gentle movement before sleep, you know, doom scrolling, all of us are on social media, it, some of those common things that everyone's struggling with, any words of wisdom that both of you could share on sleep and then I'll, I'll refer to the specific question, but that's the first part of her question um, on sleep. As you said, Dr. Mishra, it's an enormous topic and, and for very good reason. I mean, this is clearly something that so many members of our cancer community struggle with for very understandable reasons. Um, and a lot of the pressure to sort of implement some of these behavioral changes to improve sleep can cause a lot of stress. <laughs> And that in turn can make sleep worse. I think that was one of the, the comments in the Q&A is, gosh, it can feel like such a vicious cycle. I know I need to get more sleep to optimize my health, but the more that I stress and worry about not getting enough sleep, the less I sleep. Um, so one of the um, more evidence-based frameworks for supporting good sleep habits is actually something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. It's considered to be really the gold standard out there for treatment of insomnia, and it can be adapted in specific ways to accommodate some of the challenges of cancer treatments. Um, it uh, tends to incorporate behavioral strategies like um, the sleep hygiene that we spoke about a little bit earlier, but then also cognitive techniques to help us evaluate how our thoughts might be bringing us closer to or further away from sleep. So you, you referenced, you know, how many hours of sleep. I think sometimes we can start to feel um, 
quite paralyzed by the expectation that we absolutely need to get eight hours of sleep every night, lest we be compromising our health in, in serious ways. What we tend to know from the literature is that most folks, it's you know, kind of a bell curve, um, you know, most folks tend to feel their best at somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. Um, but we also know that sleep needs change throughout our, our lifespan and our development. Um, so the sleep needs of a of a two-year-old are very different from the sleep needs of a 22-year-old versus a, an 82-year-old. And we know that sleep needs may shift as well during cancer treatment. And so thoughts about oh my goodness, I need to get eight hours of sleep tonight. Otherwise I might be jeopardizing my health or compromising the efficacy of my treatment. Those kinds of anxious thoughts can actually drag us further and further away from sleep. And so cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI as it's abbreviated helps us to figure out how can we be in a different kind of relationship with some of those thoughts so that we can, um, rather than feeling like we're in a constant tug of, tug of war essentially with our insomnia, find ways of sort of self-compassionately dropping the rope, which allows us actually paradoxically to kind of settle into sleep more ease. And, and just to follow up on that, for CBTI, how might um, folks in the audience be able to actually access that? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, many psychologists out in private practice are, are trained in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, UCSF has um, an Osher Center um, uh, sleep lab um, led by a, a phenomenal psychologist to run CBTI groups. Um, my department over the last few years has offered CBTI support for UCSF patients. So if that's of interest, that's a good of access. Perfect. Uh, anything to mm -hmm. add, Dr. Ware, tomorrow? I would say, so I think of a couple of things. One, what, what kind of sleep problems do you have? Do you have sleep breathing problems? Do you have circadian rhythm problems? Or do you have sleep behavior problems? So talking with your doctor and getting really screened about, you might have sleep-wake issues, which you know we, we know as people get older, their uh, melatonin production and also the resistance um, changes. And so there, there might be some changes in the brain. We also, you, know, you might also have sleep, you also might have sleep breathing problems like sleep apnea and things like that. So we would really wanna make sure and not miss that. Um, and then I think um, then of course, sleep behavior issues, right? So one of some of the um, issues that Dr. Cohen was talking about. And I think my two favorite tips is don't sleep, don't lay in bed awake. That was, that's one of the major ones is that if you can't sleep and, um, and you shouldn't be way, laying in bed awake for hours and hours and hours, because then your bed, your bed becomes associated with not sleeping, try to limit caffeine because caffeine can stay in the body for many, many hours after you drink it. So try to not have that late afternoon, um, cup of coffee, and then also try not to take naps too late in the day because that can negatively impact your sleep. So some of the, I think the nurse in me kind of comes out a little bit. So thinking about uh, sleep. And then of course, if, if, um, if there is, you know, you're noticing that worrying is, or, and, or there's a lot of emotional distress that, you know, like Dr. Khan said, CBTI is just a, it's just a top-notch treatment for, for those types of challenges. Wonderful. And, and a practical follow-up on that. So if someone asks, hey, what time should I stop having that caffeine or what time yeah. is time to not have that late afternoon nap? My best understanding is gotta like it can stay in the body for up to 12 hours. Caffeine can stay in the body for a very long time and metabolism can vary by person. So I encourage people to really have their body be the guide um, and try to slowly but surely cut it out earlier and earlier and earlier until you, to, to you find your sweet spot. That's super helpful and practical. Um, and just to finish up Victoria's question on sleep, she had asked more specifically about melatonin and um, she asked, hey, can you speak about marijuana to use as an aid, a sleep aid? Her oncologist recommended against it during chemotherapy mm -hmm. and she didn't understand why. I wonder if either of you has a comment on that. Well, I can speak about it from a cognitive perspective. So, um, so marijuana, especially if it's high THC, it can cause rebound anxiety, which can exacerbate, um, especially if you already have anxiety challenges that are negatively impacting your sleep. Um, and there's, there's a real reason why you're having trouble sleeping. Those things can, can sometimes um, not fully, you can symptomatically treat it, but not actually treat the cause. And so it's very important to understand the actual cause of the difficulties related to sleep rather than 
um, rather than kind of um, going to medication before you fully really understood the cause of it. Now, melatonin has less cognitive side effects, but other medications like anticholinergic medications such as Benadryl um, can really have a, a really nasty impact on your cognition. Um, so it, it's thinking together with your doctors about really what is the cause of your sleeping difficulties and what is then the best way to treat that. Sometimes substances, certain substances can help, but they can also make it worse too. And, and so I, I think that just being mindful of that. That's that's really helpful. And so and I think specifically for Victoria, sounds like there may be an order of operations to really figure out what's the cause. And then once you have that discussion with your oncologist, figuring out what might be options. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Uh, a question for Dr. Weyer Jamora. Um, do cognitive changes due to surgery depend on from happen from anesthesia or from other causes? So it depends on the nature of the surgery. So people can have can have some cognitive changes as it relates to, um, you know, they feel kind of confused when they wake up from anesthesia. Usually those effects are reversible. They, they do go away over time. But if you have, um, but if you have brain surgery, then sometimes you can have um, negative cognitive impacts as it relates to the surgery itself. Generally over the three and six months after surgery, those are expected to get better and better as the swelling in the brain goes down and that um, and the brain heals. Although many of the patients that I work with in the brain tumor center, they, they continue to experience persistent cognitive changes and have to find ways to manage those. So I would say it's a yes and. Yes and. <laughs> Um, William asked, and this may have just been in one of one slide as you were mentioning it, cognitive help question mark. Mm -hmm. um, he asked to run that concept again. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that means that sometimes you, you've done all the things and you need a cognitive comp consultant, really. You need somebody to help you um, understand if the changes that you're experiencing, what they're due to, are they due to mood issues, are they due to fatigue or sleep issues, um, or are they due to something else, and then what to do about them. So get, cogn um, get uh, cognitive help really is talking with your doctor about why you may be experiencing those changes. Are there any, is there any medical workup or medications that may be contributing to that? And then, it, and then if they're still stumped, then sometimes they send you to a cognitive specialist like a neuropsychologist to better understand what's going on. And then this is a comment that Dr. Cohen was mentioning. Um, while sleep is absolutely important, insomnia is difficult to control for insomniacs. All of this emphasis on sleep only puts extra stress on them. Um, and Dr. Cohen, you spoke really beautifully about kind of how to uh, acknowledge that and potentially try to work from there in ways to help. Um, I'm going to try to get to as many questions because I know that we're short on time from different folks. And so Arjita asks, you mentioned physical movement as being a way to counter fatigue, but it's often hard to get moving when you're already feeling tired. Any tips on how to break that vicious cycle to either of you who wants to comment? And I can speak to that for a moment. So um, we know that that movement within the parameters that your treatment team deems safe is a great way of sort of energizing the body, strengthening the body, but it really is hard to get momentum because it feels counterintuitive. You know, psychologically, we want to be conserving energy when we feel fatigued. Um, so one of the things that we can do is, is um, uh, uh, employ a bit of a cognitive technique, which is sort of challenging this assumption of, well, I'll, I'll move when I feel a little bit better because actually it's moving that is likely to help you feel a little bit better. So just kind of gently challenging that, that thought of, I'll wait to do it until I feel better. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of execution, really important. So not setting too lofty of a goal, it doesn't mean that you have to go out um, when you're feeling at your lowest for a 30 minute walk. It may just mean trying to put on your tennis shoes and walking to the end of the driveway. Um, and just sort of seeing how you feel. Sometimes all we can do is put on the tennis shoes and walk out the door and we may hit the doormat and say, that's what I've got in me right now. And we can give ourselves a pat on the back for that with some tenderness and compassion, head back in and try a little bit later. Um, so I, I like to call it the tennis shoe challenge. Um, you know, sometimes you don't think you have a full amount of movement in you. See if you can just get your shoes on and out the front door. And if you accomplish that, give yourself a pat on the back and reevaluate in that moment. Can you go a little bit further? And if not, 
head back in, try a little bit more later. If so, maybe try to the end of the driveway. Um, but to set um, what we call SMART goal, something that's specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic for you in that moment, and time-bound. Um, and that can sometimes help us strategize getting a little bit longer for that. That's a really great framework, the SMART framework. Um, and yes, the idea of exercise snacks, as we've heard um, in one of the earlier talks, but yeah, that idea of kind of doing what is attainable. Um, someone asks, if you are not capable of meditating, um, what if you are not capable of meditating if you've tried practicing mindfulness and it simply does not work for you? What next? So it, it is very much this muscle that requires constant conditioning. It is hard for such a, um, you know, perhaps simple premise. It's really difficult in execution. Um, one of the things that we can do is if we're trying to be mindful, let's say, of our breathing um, and we notice our mind wandering, um, one of my favorite techniques is to just say to myself, I'm noticing my mind is wandering. I'm noticing my mind is wandering. So we can be the observer of the wandering mind. Um, and you can start in the same way that you would maybe a curious child who sort of seen something in their environment that feels new and distracting. They want to wander off and explore that and how you would sort of gently take it by the hand and say, oh, that is interesting, isn't it? But come on back this way for a moment. Um, so we can do Line to, um, if you're trying to focus on a, a meditation script or breathing or your thoughts and they kind of go off onto your shopping list and your to-do list or memories, things that happened in the past, you know, approach your mind like that. Or isn't that curious? You've wandered off to see this interesting thing. I see that you're wandering off. Come on back to me now. And Dr. Cohen, you went a little bit in and out for me. I don't know oh. if that was for others but sorry about that but, we, but, but i got I, I got it and actually just to add on to that i had once heard a teacher say name it to tame it and that really stuck with me because as dr cohen is saying you sort of are able to name things and just by naming it sometimes it can help you the other tidbit sometimes is movement before meditation often just going straight into a mindfulness practice or meditation is really difficult so moving yoga tai chi qigong whatever um, that can sometimes help to go into this. Dr. Weir Jamora, question for you um, from an oncology provider. Are there any quick screening tools to use to help identify specific cognitive changes or deficits in cancer patients or questions you recommend we ask to help identify possible deficit areas? Some of the, I think some, of, so I think that um, the best thing that you can do is ask about the symptoms and then ask about how that's negatively impacting their day to day. So it's, it's so it's one thing to have forgetfulness. It's another that it prevents them from taking their medications accurately. It's so I think it's both what the symptom is as well as the functional impact that can give you some real insight into how big of a deal it is. And then asking the patient or asking the individual that's experiencing the cognitive symptoms, how important it is for you, how, is, how important in your care is it that we address this? So really having that, that, uh, that kind of, uh, that, that goals of care conversation along with the cognition, along with the impact and function is, far and away really the most important thing above and beyond screening. So you can think about like, for example, the MOCA or some of these other screening measures, but really I think that the most, um, the most insightful is understanding what the symptom is, what the functional impact is that keeps them from doing their, their daily, you know, their daily living. And then also how important it is and distressing it is for the person, because then that will say, okay, well, well, this is, this is definitely something that we, we need to get on. And, and then um, talking with your, your colleagues about, okay, what, what, are, um, what, are, what else am I missing? Um, is there any other reversible medical issues that we can optimize? Can I have pharmacy take a look at their medication list because they have a laundry list and they might have partial effects of anticholinergics and things like that. So really working up those reversible causes um, also is, is really helpful. I do like serial tracking of cognition over time. That can be really helpful, um, but not. But it doesn't replace a good clinical interview of a question 
of to a patient about how how what's going on, how big of a deal is this to you, and how is it impacting you day to day. And any specific tools that you use commonly? Yeah, so on the inpatient side, when I'm seeing folks and I need to screen them, um, so I'll um, sometimes I'll do a MOCA if they have some mild um, thinking changes. More so, I, I use um, you know I, I use an, another um, another tool um, called the um, it's it's an IADL tool um, where I'm asking them what a what what to remember an address and then asking them to return to say it back to me asking them some questions about orientation and what's the date. And, and then also I'm, I'm asking them about some recent current events. Um, you know, oftentimes if you, um, if you integrate that into your exam, that in and of itself, I think is, is useful, but you can use some of the more standardized uh, measures such as the MOCA or the slums. And um, the mini cog is, is great for, has great sensitivity and specificity in terms of hit rate for more serious cognitive impairment. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to hold you for one more minute so we can get to another small, a couple of questions. Um, uh, for Dr. Cohen, sometimes despite getting enough hours of sleep, it's difficult to get restful sleep, waking up tired. Any tips on how to counter that? That can be one of the challenges with um, cancer-related fatigue, as we understand it, is that um, even if you get restful and restorative sleep, you could still wake up feeling quite fatigued, um, almost as if you were... Um, uh, sort of elderly cell phone battery and you had it, let's say, plugged in overnight for, you know, eight solid hours. And the second you pull it out of the outlet in the morning, it seems like it's already down to 65%. Um, so a few things that can, can help with that. Um, we, there is good evidence to suggest that strategic light exposure can help energize in the morning um, if you're feeling fatigued after a, a poor night's sleep. So making sure that you're not lingering in bed for too long, um, trying to get up as soon as you can, opening up some windows and blinds to get some exposure to full spectrum light. Um, if you can even take a walk outside in the morning, especially as we get into the summer months where there's more daytime light exposure. Um, make sure, of course, that you're using good sun protection, unless we create other problems. Um, but uh, those are a couple of things that can help. Not lingering in bed in the morning, even if you had a poor night's sleep, go ahead and get up and get some of those feel-good endorphins moving in to try to get into some natural light. Perfect. And Dr. Ware Jamora, you mentioned THC. Mm -hmm. uh, one question came in, I think probably for you, but Dr. Cohen also can add. Any problems with using a CBD tincture regularly to help with good sleep? I don't really have an opinion about the sleep part, but it more on the cognitive part. There's, you know, less, um, there's, there's less in there, at least with the, the beginning studies are showing there's less impact of uh, CBD on, um, on cognition. Um, that doesn't mean it's fully safe for, for use. I, I think that it's still the wild west in terms of, um, in terms of dose and um, validation of that and, and how that impacts people. Um, and, Honestly, I, I think that one thing I definitely see is people that have um, brain changes, they, they metabolize things such as CBD and THC differently than before. So they, they might anticipate that they get therapeutic effects, but they in fact, unfortunately don't. So, and I think that making sure that you're talking with your doctor, if you're using CBD, cause it might have interaction effects with other medications as well. So just making sure that you're kind of uh, ticking those boxes off um, because you might be, it could cause more, it could cause more uh, restlessness rather than not. Thank you both so much. There was um, a quick question on green tea, potentially impacting sleep. Like everything, there's some pros and cons to things. So just watch when you take it and if it's affecting sleep, take it earlier in the day. I know people who take their four cups of green tea before noon. Um, so thank you both. I think we got to almost every question. Um, and yes, and uh, really appreciate your very practical take on coping sleep strategies how to deal with, um, how to think about mind, body, spirit. So really appreciate both of you.